that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, ce que nous avons vu de nos yeux, which we have looked upon, es lo que hemos mirado. The word of life. Welcome to the amazing collection, The Bible for Women, book by book, and I'm so glad you could join us today. We are going to begin the New Testament, and it is going to be a mo most joyful ride. If you have your Bibles in front of you, if you would open to the book of Matthew and your workbooks to the book of Matthew, we'll get started. I was sitting on my porch swing with my three-year-old granddaughter, Sydney, who is, by the way, perfect. Sometime I'll have to take a couple of hours and tell you about my grandchildren. And Sydney and I were eating popsicles. And the door to the kitchen was open, and sitting in the high chair was one-year-old Coulter. He also is perfect, and yet this day he had his little sin nature on, and he had his head back, and he was screaming at the top of his lungs, and he was pounding the top of his high chair because lunch had not been delivered on time. Sydney leans forward and looks into the kitchen, and she says, Mimi, look at that little Coulter with his smiley face. <laughs> and then she leans back, and she said, He is such a good man. Now, I look at Coulter, and what I see is a one-year-old having a tantrum. But what she saw was Coulter with a smiley face, what a good man. And right then, I just thought of those words, looking through the eyes of love, that she was looking through the eyes of love. Now, when we get to the book of Matthew, Matthew is the author. And Jesus when he met Matthew, was looking through eyes of love because he did not see who Matthew was at that moment. But what he saw was what Matthew could become. Before we get started into the book, I want to tell you a little bit about this Matthew. He was a tax collector. Now, that might not mean so much to you, but let me tell you what that meant in those days. He was an outcast. You see, he was a Jew but he was working for the Roman government. He was a Jew working for the enemy. And he collected your taxes. And the way he did this was if the tax for a certain thing was, say, $10, he would have to collect $10 from you and send it to Rome. But he had to make a profit. And so he might charge you mm, $20. You see, he would do it through deceit or through lies, or through manipulation, or through extortion, but he was going to get his money. Tax collectors were quite wealthy, so he was wealthy, and yet the Jews looked at him as unclean. He was an outcast from the Jews. It's interesting what the Bible says about this man. He is simply sitting in his office. You can see him sitting at his desk, shuffling his papers around, getting ready for the day. And it said, a man, Jesus, walked by, looked at him, and said, follow me. That was it. He didn't give him a good reason why he should follow him. He didn't have to discuss it with him. He just walked by and said, you, follow me, Matthew. And it says, Matthew stood up from his desk and followed Jesus. 
And the next thing you see is Matthew, the great sinner, having a dinner party, inviting the perfect man, Jesus, and inviting all of his sinner friends. And that is all we know about Matthew, except this. Sometime later, out of all the men that, Je that Jesus could have chosen, he chose Matthew to be one of the 12 <laughs> disciples, a sinner an unclean, an outcast, a deceiver. But Jesus chose Matthew. Matthew did become one of the 12 disciples. He did write the book of Matthew some about 30 years later. He would go on to spread the good news and he would die a martyr's death for his Lord. Now that's who's writing this book. When you come to this book, it is the first one in the New Testament. It wasn't necessarily the first one written, but it was put first because, it's the, because it is the perfect book to bridge the Old Testament with the New Testament. You see, Matthew was, was speaking to a Jewish audience. He was a Jew and he wanted to talk to the Jewish audience. And what he wanted to tell them is, hey, look, the promised Messiah is here in Jesus Christ, and it is better than we ever expected. And that's what he's saying through this book. Jesus Christ, the long-awaited King of the Jews, has arrived. When you look in your workbook, the first part there is the prophet announced the Messiah King. As you are reading through Matthew, one thing you will notice is over and over and over again, he is going to refer back to the Old Testament. In your Bibles, m many of the Bibles will be in, in different kind of print, and that's going to be words from the Old Testament. About 130 times he will refer back to something that was said by one of the prophets or one of the books in the Old Testament. He is trying to prove to the Jews God had said it, it did come to pass. Jesus Christ precisely fulfilled over 300 prophecies. There are about 400 that have not been fulfilled yet, and they will be fulfilled at his second coming. So you're going to see that Matthew refers over and over again to Old Testament books. You will see, first of all, that he gives a very lengthy genealogy, and he starts with Abraham, because everyone knew that the long-awaited Messiah must come from the seed of Abraham. He must come from Isaac. He must come from Jacob, and then he must come from the tribe of Judah. And Matthew is proving that Jesus did all of these things. Isaiah tells us that, that Jesus must come from the throne of David, and there in that genealogy, you're going to see David right there. Micah told us that he must be come from Bethlehem. Isaiah said that the long-awaited king must be born of a virgin. Hosea said he would come out of Egypt. Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies. When you look at this genealogy, one thing I don't want you to miss is the number of women that Matthew mentions, and th some of them are not like the little saints. It is such a beautiful picture of God's redemption for his daughters. Tamar is mentioned, Rahab the prostitute, Ruth, and Bathsheba. These are women who didn't have a spotless past, and yet God chose them to be in the line of Jesus Christ. You see, he is a God of graciousness, a God who redeems. So Matthew says, first of all, the prophets have said it, now it's come to pass. Number two, the preparation of the king. We have already seen just in his genealogy that he has come from a royal line. He had to come from the throne of David. Next, he had to come from a virgin. And we find out that there is this lovely little girl named Mary, and she is told that she is going to have a child through the Holy Spirit. Now, this wouldn't necessarily be the best news. She was engaged to Joseph, and that would cause some problems in the hometown. The angel announced that 
Jesus would be born to Joseph because Joseph was quite anxious about his little girlfriend being pregnant. And the angel calmed him and said, no, no, this is of God. And so it, it just in those small ways, you see that there is majesty surrounding this preparation. Next, we see that there was a star that guided wise men. These wise men were Gentiles. They were not Jews. God has opened up redemption to all people. And this star miraculously guided these men from afar over land to the very spot where Jesus was born. You see, his whole birth was surrounded with unusual happenings, with absolute majesty. His baptism also was marked with majesty. Jesus at this point now is about 30 years old. Isaiah said that there was one calling in the wilderness. We find out that that is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is an unusual man. He is, he is out baptizing people who come his way in the Jordan. He is the cousin of Jesus Christ. And as he is baptizing, Jesus arrives. John recognizes him as the Messiah and says, I can't baptize you, but Jesus insists. And right there, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus Christ and something very unusual happens. The heavens open up. The dove of, a Holy, of the Holy Spirit comes down and rests on Jesus, and God speaks, this is my son whom I am well pleased. And right there we have the most beautiful picture of the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all together in one beautiful picture. From there, Jesus goes into the wilderness, and he meets the tempter, who we know as Satan, and there he is going to be tempted. And even in his temptation, there is majesty. First of all, Jesus proves that he is sinless because he does not give in to the most extraordinary temptations. He proves that he is different from all others. Even Satan, with all of his power, could not make Jesus Christ sin. And now we move to the preaching and the power of Jesus Christ. In this book, there are five sermons that Jesus is going to give. The first one you are going to find in chapter five. It would be a very wise thing to spend a goodly amount of time in chapter five, six, and seven, because in those little chapters right there, you are going to find the Sermon on the Mount, the dearly loved Sermon on the Mount. You will find the Beatitudes, and you are going to find the Lord's Prayer right in those chapters. And it's a good idea to get that in your mind, because when someone wants to know where the Lord's Prayer is, you're going to be able to find it right there in those chapters. At the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not showing his people the way to salvation. What he is doing instead is saying, if you are saved, if you belong to my kingdom, this is the way you're going to behave. The Beatitudes come first. And I will tell you quite truthfully, it's not necessarily good news because it is almost seems like God looks at things the exact opposite of, we do, of the way we do. First of all, he starts with blessed. Blessed meaning happy, happy. Happy, happy are those who are poor in spirit and those who mourn over their sin. Happy, happy are those who are gentle and hunger and thirst for righteousness. Happy, happy are those who are merciful and pure in heart. Happy are those who make peace. And happy are those who are persecuted. In a million years, we wouldn't have come up with that one because no one wants to be persecuted and we don't associate it with being blessed. And yet Jesus says, if you are persecuted for my sake, you are blessed indeed. 
He will continue with some of the ways that we are to live in this new kingdom. And once again, we wouldn't have come up with this. We thought the laws in the Old Testament were enough, but God, Jesus Christ, tightens them just a bit. And what we find is that we cannot live in this kingdom without the power of God working in us to live it out. Our natural man cannot live in this way. He starts with murder. Now we know we shouldn't murder. And he makes it much harder and says, even if you hate your brother, then that is considered murder. Adultery. Don't commit adultery, says the Old Testament. Now Jesus says, even if you look upon a woman with lust in your eyes, you have committed adultery. And probably one of the hardest ones is love your enemies. Love that person that just breaks your heart. Love that person who lies about you, who slanders you, who deceives you, who ruins your reputation. Love him and do good to him. We need God's power to live God's way. And God knew it. We are not made to live apart from God. We must have his power. In chapter 10, there are instructions for disciples. In chapter 13 are the parables of the kingdom. In chapter 18 are the terms for discipleship. And in chapter 24 to 25 is the great Olivet Discourse. And those are the main large sermons that, God, that Jesus gives in this book. Jesus had the power of God available to him. His power proved his kingship. In the book of Matthew alone, there are 20 miracles. In all of the Gospels, there are 35. 20 of them are here in Matthew because Matthew was so wanting his Jewish people to see this is God on earth. This is our king. Leprosy is something that we don't really spend a lot of time with these days. But in those days, there was no cure. It would start with a white spot on your skin. And as soon as those showed up and you were, you were uh, diagnosed as having leprosy, you became an outcast. You could not live in society anymore. You needed to live outside the city, outside the gates with other lepers. Gradually, the disease would take hold and extremities would literally just rot and then fall off, noses, ears, fingers, arms. It was a horribly slow death as the body just rotted. When the nerve endings would be dead, you could pass your hand through a fire and never feel it. You would have tremendous burns and not know it. You could cut yourself and, and, and bleed profusely, but because you couldn't feel, you would not know this has happened. And that's why so many sores would develop on the body. You see, if you had leprosy, you had no hope. You were simply going to die. There is a picture in chapter 8 of a leper, a man without hope. Jesus Christ is walking down the road, and the leper said, says, you can heal me if you will. And it says, Jesus, the Son of God, walks over to this filthy man who is full of disease, who is an outcast, and he walks right up to him and he puts his hand on him. Unheard of. You don't touch lepers. It's disease. You don't touch a leopard. And yet God on earth touched the leper. And when he did, the sores healed. His body became whole in an instant. The man without any hope now was filled with new life and a hope for a future because Jesus, the Son of God, touched him and made him whole. You see, he had total power over disease. There is another picture in Matthew the disciples are with Jesus and they get in a boat. Now remember, some of these disciples were wonderful fishermen. They had lived on the sea. They knew how to do boats. They knew how to do storms. They were in charge. Jesus was asleep. A storm came up. 
it said that the disciples became so frightened that they thought they were going to die. Now that means they've lost control. And they go to Jesus and they say, don't you care if we perish? And he stands up and he looks at them and he said, you have little faith. Be still. And in an instant, the storm stopped, the sea calmed. Just by a spoken word, all of nature obeyed the living God. Remember Jonah? Remember when Jonah was thrown into the sea and God had the power to calm the storm immediately? Here, Jesus, God on earth, shows his disciples that that power is available to him. Another story, a synagogue official comes to Jesus. His daughter has died. Now, if you have lost someone that you love, it doesn't take much to feel his incredible pain. And the loss of a child is probably one of the greatest pains one can feel. And this synagogue official comes to Jesus and he says, my daughter is dead. But if you come, she will live again. Jesus goes. He gets to the house. The mourners are there. They were all there getting ready for the funeral. Jesus says, there's no need for this. And they leave. And he goes in. And here is the dead child, no life in her, laying there. And Jesus takes her by the hand and every cell in her body comes to life again and she sits up fully alive because Jesus is the one that chooses life and death. He can give life. He is God on earth. These are beautiful pictures that Matthew paints for us of the power that Jesus has over disease, over nature, over death. You see, he has power over everything, over everything. The predictions of the king, if you will turn to chapter 24. Jesus was getting ready to leave this earth. He knew that his death was coming soon. And so he gathers his disciples around him and he paints a picture of what the future was going to hold. Because you see, we have said all along, God never holds back. He always tells us, he always warns us what is going to take place in the future. We should never be surprised. We have been told in his word. Jesus gathers his disciples around and he says, see to it that no one misleads you because many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and they're going to lead a lot of people away. You're going to be hearing about wars and rumors of wars. Don't be frightened. And he goes on to paint a picture for us of what will happen in the end times. There will be many false prophets. There will be much deception. People will turn away from the living God. There will be famines. There will be earthquakes. There will be great persecution of believers. And by the way, this generation has seen more martyrs than any other generation before. More Christians are persecuted in this generation than have ever been persecuted at any other time in history. But God has, Jesus had said, this is going to happen. Don't be surprised. There will be cold heartedness and lawlessness. It's not a pretty picture, is it? And yet our Lord has warned us, and then he's given us very clear instructions as to how we should respond to that. First of all, he says, and for women, ladies, I think he's serious about this, especially for us as women, do not be afraid. He never wants his children to be afraid. We should live totally fearless because Christ is with us. He says, don't be afraid. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And then he says, pray. You pray. You 
know what's going to happen. The only way you're going to know what's going to happen is if you know the Word of God, and that is why we are so adamant, and we keep saying to you, read the Word, know His Word, because He tells you exactly what is going to happen. Be on the alert. <coughs> you do not know when Christ will come back again. He will come at any time, and he says, I want my children to be on the alert. I want you to be ready at all times. Be on the alert. <coughs> Serve in an acceptable way. Serve in a way that glorifies God. Serve in a way that delights God. He wants his children to live in service to the holy God as we wait his return. We are to be prepared for unexpected delay. In other words, don't get impatient. Mm -hmm. And lastly, ladies, we are to endure to the end with faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And lastly, the passion of the king. There are signs, even in Jesus' death, that he was God, even in his death, First of all, there was a sign that was placed over his head, King of the Jews. Darkness covered the land from noon to three o'clock. Now, how does that happen unless God is involved? The veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. It was God who tore the veil, signifying that now we had access to the Holy of Holies through Jesus Christ. It was God who did it. And lastly, a, a huge earthquake occurred, and when it did, there were some saints who actually came up out of their graves and began to walk around Jerusalem. These were very unusual events because this was God who had been crucified. And lastly, the greatest of all is that the fact that Jesus Christ rose from that grave, that death could not hold him, is the greatest proof that he is not just a man, but he is God himself. Matthew was speaking to the Jews, and he was shouting to them, the king has come, the king has come, the king has come, and he has come for you.